I'd like to start this morning by uh, thanking uh, all the students that have been involved in this. Um, you know, they do this every year or have done this for several years and it's social work class 435 and uh, you know you should let's all give them a, a hand because they, they do a great job and I understand that there are um, a number of seniors in the room would uh, all of the seniors in that class please stand Thanks, thanks for all your effort and your hard work to make this uh, possible. Uh, also, uh, thanks are due to ROTC and uh, our cadets and ROTC leadership. If you would please stand so that we can recognize you. They do a lot of heavy lifting to help support this. Thank you. Well, my job this morning is to introduce Mr. Corey Steele. He was appointed to the state court administrator as the state court administrator on May 2nd, 2014, to oversee the administrative operations of the statewide court system. The state court administrator plans for statewide judicial branch needs, develops and promotes statewide administrative practices and procedures, oversees the operation of the trial court program and uh, strategic initiatives, and serves as a liaison with other branches of government. Steele has been serving in the capacity of Deputy Probation Administrator for Juvenile Services since July 1, 2013. He played an active role in providing information to the legislature regarding juvenile justice reform. Steele also served as Juvenile Justice Specialist for the Office of Probation Administration. Throughout his employment, Steele has been heavily engaged in the transformation of probation's juvenile justice system. Serving in a leadership capacity, he was involved in the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative JDAI, excuse me, JDAI, the Crossover Youth Practice Model, and the Juvenile Information Sharing Project. Steele served as Acting Chief Probation Officer in Omaha's Juvenile Probation Office and also in Beatrice. Before joining the Office of Probation Administration, he was Lancaster County Human Services Juvenile Justice Coordinator. Corey began his probation career as a drug technician in 1998 and was appointed juvenile probation officer in Lincoln in September 1998. I'm going to ask him to come up here in just a second, but first I have a couple of housekeeping chores that I need to, to uh, let you know. We are running a little bit behind, so if uh, Mr. Steele goes a little bit long, uh, don't, don't worry about that. They've got a plan for that. And if the panel that follows would uh, line up over in this area on my right uh, at 1230, we'll get you up onto the podium. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Corey Steele, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you. With me today, I have Jeannie Brander as well. Jeannie Brander is the Deputy Probation Administrator in charge of Juvenile Services. Um, I actually uh, recruited Jeannie, so to speak, from Arizona, from the state of Arizona, where she was a, <clears throat> in the juvenile justice side of the Supreme Court of Arizona um, going on two years ago. And she was my assistant deputy administrator through this transformation. And she has since taken over now as deputy administrator of juvenile services. So we're going to tag team this presentation um, as she'll get down in the weeds a little bit about juvenile probation and where they're at today. But I want to thank you for inviting us here today. This is an honor to come out to Western Nebraska. Any chance we get to come out to this beautiful country, we try to take great advantage of that. I've been out here several times in the last few years with the transformation, because <clears throat> it started actually as a pilot in Western Nebraska, and I'll touch on that as we go. So we wanted to make sure as this juvenile justice transformation worked, it not only worked in the metro area in the Omaha, Nebraska area, but also worked in a rural area with our smaller courts and our county courts that act as separate juvenile courts. So we have, we have some slides up here um, that I'm going to go through, but I'm going to go off script a little bit because I want to give you a little bit more history, more in depth about Nebraska. Um, for those of you that are criminal justice or social work majors that are taking juvenile justice, these first couple slides are not new to you. Um, so go ahead, Aaron. Uh, the first slide talks about history of juvenile justice. Cook County, Illinois was the first juvenile court uh, in 1899. 
And that was the start of juvenile court. So juvenile court has only been in our system in the United States for a little over 100 years. Prior to that, juveniles were treated as adults. No matter what your age, no matter what you did, you would go to the adult court system. And so as the United States started adapt, adapting juvenile court practices, we continue to grow, build, and do what's right for juveniles. Even up to this day, we're still treating juveniles in some areas in the same manner as we do adults. So with this transformation of juvenile justice, we're really trying to take a look at what juvenile needs are. Research is coming out every day, just like in any other type of science, but in juvenile justice specifically, let me see, we got a lot of students here. Let me see a show of hands of who's under 24 years old. A lot, all right? I'm here to tell you, there is science that says your brain is not fully developed and you're going to still make mistakes, all right? And that's why we have juvenile court. And that's why you start to see in Judge Basis' uh, jurisdiction in Douglas County, young adult court, you start to see those types of courts because we need to deal with these individuals and these um, people that don't have the capacity to make those right decisions all the time differently. We need to address those issues in a different manner. And that's what we're doing on the juvenile justice side, continuing to grow and build, follow the research, and do what's right for juveniles. Go ahead. So why reform? Why reform in Nebraska? Well, in Nebraska, there was a lot of things that were um, moving down the same track, so to speak. Um, in the early 80s to mid 80s, there was a transformation that started in the early 90s of the Office of Juvenile Services. Earlier to that, we had juvenile probation. If you did something wrong, you went to our highest level of care, YRTC, Youth Rehabilitation Treatment Center, Kearney or Geneva. And then you were put out on parole. It's called juvenile parole. Well, let me tell you something. Even into the 90s, juvenile parole was ran at the Department of Corrections. So we had adult correctional system overseeing our juveniles that were coming out of our rehabilitation and treatment center. Didn't make much sense. So there started some legislation at that time to transform a juvenile type parole or aftercare system. Great idea, had some great possibilities. One of the problems was it went to a human services agency, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, which addresses our abuse and neglected population. And so they became state wards. Fast forward into the early 2000s, we start to take a look at an increased population with the state as becoming state wards, a decreased population through the juvenile court being placed on probation. And as we start to do some research, we start to find out why is that? Why are we seeing an increased amount of kids going to the Department of Health and Human Services for law violations that should come through juvenile court and be placed on juvenile probation? What we found out was when you become a state ward, at this point in time, you receive full Medicaid funding and the state would pay for any care and cost and treatment for that individual. And so some leaders came together in the, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s with the Department of Health and Human Services, Chief Justice Hevick and Ellen Burkowski, our probation administrator. We sat around the table and said, how can we make it where these kids don't need to become state wards? Because in the state of Nebraska, when you become a state ward, the state now is your parent or guardian. They pay for your treatment. It disempowers the family. How can we make it where they can still stay on juvenile probation, the court can remain and still have oversight over that case, and we can get their treatment needs met? And so this group with the, with the governor, um, Governor Heineman on board, Chief Justice Hevekin, their leadership said, let's do something different. Let's do a pilot. Where should we do this pilot? We thought, well, if we can make something work in Omaha, we can make something work anywhere. And so this is where we started that transformation. We started that problem solving and said, how can we do things differently? We worked out a collaborative agreement with the Department of Health and Human Services and said, give us some dollars that you're currently spending on your state wards and let's try to divert these kids and keep them on probation, keep them at home in order to access those treatment-based services. New concept, because if you were a kid in the court system in the, in the 2000s prior to this reform and you needed access to services and your family couldn't afford it, your fa you became a state ward. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. We talk about through the court system fair and equal access to justice and services. Well, that wasn't fair and equal access because if you were a poor kid, you became a state ward. And there's stigma that comes with that. If you were a kid that your family had insurance or had money to pay for your services, you stayed on probation. And you had a probation officer, less intrusive, more kids at home. And so we started this paradigm shift and we started to say, 
A, we want to keep more kids at home. That was the primary goal of this transformation. We want to put more services in place, we want to keep kids at home, and we want to make sure that all service needs are getting met with court oversight. And so through this transformation and this pilot project in Omaha, we started after the first year to see some successful outcomes. We were taking populations at one point in time that would have been made a state ward and we kept them with probation with court oversight. Less kids were going in out of home care, more kids were getting more services, and we were building more services within the community as well. One of the fundamental differences with the pilot program was we did not contract for services. So we did not go to one provider and say, we want you to provide all of this service. We want you to provide all of this service. We said it's an open market. We want more providers. We want providers to su supply a lot of services. So the concept with probation is a fee for service. So there, it's an individual contract, one-on-one. -on -one. You provide service for this kid, we will fund you for that service. That does a couple things. That concept grows more providers because now it's an open competition. It raises the level of providers because they're not going to have one contract and they know as long as they have that contract they're going to get funding. So it raises the bar on the services that they provide. And it also gives us matching capabilities. So I'll use my example that we used in Omaha when I spoke there. I have a North Omaha kid that's African American. It does not do me any good if I, my provider I contract with is South Omaha white male that's going to tell them to stop using drugs and alcohol, not understanding their culture. So we can really start matching kids with the right service providers that are culturally competent and also know where these individuals come from and what they're about. So we had great success in this pilot after the first and second and, and going into the third year. And it started to catch some traction with the legislature. And so we told the legislature, let's, let's formalize this agreement that we've had with the Department of Health and Human Services through some legislation. Let's, let's make these kids have better outcomes by keeping them under court supervision. And so from that was born LB 561, which was the first big juvenile justice a legislation since the Office of Juvenile Services, I believe, in the early or, or mid to late 90s. And this solidified Omaha as a pilot project. What it also did is we took a look and said, we need to do this across the state. So where else can we do this? And we had two great senators that stood up in the legislature and said, I want it in North Platte and I want it in Scotts Bluff. And so we said, you know what, let's take the whole panhandle then. That's one, one court jurisdiction. Let's take that panhandle and see what we can do in the western part of Nebraska. Because we know not as many providers, we know longer to travel for services, and we know that kids were, when they were going out of home, were going out of home a ways away from home. So we said, let's take that on as well. And so we had the pilot program in Omaha, in the metro area where there was not lack of providers, to a rural-based system to see if it would work across this state. And so there was a year of transformation. With this was building staff, more probation officers in the field, more service providers in the communities, opening up those contracts so it wasn't a, a big time contract to do all those services, and building capacity for those services. And so the concept was born of what was called the Nebraska Juvenile Service Delivery Project through probation. With LB 561, we were hoping to get about two years down the road and show outcomes and really show the legislature, here's what we can do. Um, I know we're a ways from Lincoln, and unfortunately my office is right in the capital in Lincoln, so I know that how this operates. Senators are not patient. Senators are not patient at all, and the fact it was set out that this would be a two, three year, we're going to have an evaluation and a study, and we're going to show that it works. By that next legislative session, there was another bill out there to transform the whole system. Oh, to include a lot of other things. And so uh, we went and rolled with it. The evaluation shored up very quickly and we showed success. We were showing success that we were able to keep more kids in home. How were we able to show that? The Office of Juvenile Services at the point of transitioning those cases um, the, the following year was about a 60% of those kids with the Office of Juvenile Services were in out of home care. So there was about 1,400 kids that were under the state's care and custody that would fit into this pilot program and when they weren't out of home care. Our mantra with probation was we want to do everything we can to keep them in home. We want to wrap more services around them. We want to put more services in place for the family to keep those juveniles at home. Today, or as of last week, with probation and the probation population is, is 
larger. We have about 4,000 kids at any given time on juvenile probation. We only have 400 kids in out-of-home care. 10 to 12 percent of kids in out-of-home care. Okay. Now, we have a much larger population, but if you even took the 1,400 kids that were transitioned, only 400 total kids in out-of-home care, that's still a lower percentage. We want to keep moving. That's not good enough for us with the courts and with probation. We want to keep reducing that population. So as we were showing success with this program, the senators came to and said, we're going to do a new juvenile justice package, and that was last year's bill, LB 464. This would then take that pilot program, make it statewide, so no matter where you were in the state, the court would have judicial oversight of your case from start to finish. You would have access to services as needed. It wouldn't be you would have to come a state ward. And we would continue that mantra of keeping kids and families in their family home and providing those services and working with those service providers. When we started this program, Todd Reckling at that time was the Director of Children and Family Services and currently now Thomas Pristo is, is Director of Children and Family Services. Statewide, they had anywhere between 50 and 60 contracts for the Office of Juvenile Services to provide those services. Statewide, they had 50 to 60 contracts. Right now, we currently have over 1,600, is it up to at least? 1,600 providers that we can call on to provide those services across the state. So as you can see, we wouldn't contract with one provider to do that. We'll contract with anybody as long as they follow those rules and regulations that are set forth by us. And we work with those individuals um, so that they can provide those services. So 464 comes along, and now we have this great task of, in nine months, ramping up a juvenile probation system. What does that mean? That meant we had to hire 100 more probation officers across the state of Nebraska. So I don't know how many of you have hired staff, but to hire 100 staff within six to seven months, train them staff, have them ready to take cases, that was a monster feat that our administrative office took on and we delivered. We also then had to hire about 35 more administrative staff because prior to Jeannie, prior to LB 561, our juvenile justice division within the administrative office was right here. Right here. I didn't even have a clerical. I was the first juvenile person hired in the administrative office to solely focus on juvenile justice issues. Now there is a staff of the juvenile justice side of 16, about 16 with the fee-for-service side. So over the past seven years, it's grown from one person to when we had the pilot program in Omaha, I was allowed to hire one person to help me, and now it's grown to 16 in the last year. And of that, then we hired um, more staff uh, for the districts as well. Not only 100 new probation officers, but about 45 more support staff, drug technicians, and managers to help those probation districts out. So of that, about 145, 150 of those staff went to the field. They were in the field doing the work of supervising these juveniles that were coming over. So we worked real collaboratively with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Juvenile Services through this transition period. 1,400 cases in nine months, hire 190 staff in nine months, have policies and procedures for new programs and services that were put in place, and let alone probation, um, what we did as probation officers expanded. There's a, there's a table of probation officers over there. Those of you that were here prior to this, we were probation officers. We're no longer probation officers on the juvenile justice side. We're case managers. It's a dual function of what we have to do. Not only do we have to follow the court order and make sure those juveniles are doing what they're told, but we also have to get them their service needs, make sure their service needs are being met, and make sure that the family is providing all the access to the treatment that's there. So the role of even our probation officers that have been, along, been around for a long time vastly changed. And so taking on this transformation in nine months, were there bumps? Yes. Were there issues? Yes. But we individually went case by case with the Department of Health and Human Services and determined what was best suited for that juvenile, went back to the court and said, here's where this kid should be placed, here's where this kid should go, and here's what outlined service needs are met. And the judiciary, all the judges took that on and had every case seen before July 1 of this year. So it was a great feat to for this transition. This is a transition that probably should have taken two or three years. Realistically, should have taken two or three years to move through this process. But with that collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services, with the employing every staff in the administrative office to do, to do this work, we were able to transform that to July 1 of this year. So what does that mean? 
what are we doing now in juvenile probation than what, that's different than when we were. So go ahead to the next slide. In the administrative of the office, and, and the table over there is going to laugh, we're, we're big on pictures. Right? We need to see it. We need to see what is new, what is there, what isn't there. And so we created a picture and we thought, how can we do this to show that A, we're going to be strong and united in what we do in juvenile probation, B, show that we're solid in the formation of this new juvenile probation system, and get the picture out there so everybody can see what we're doing. And we, so we came up with this pillar, as you know, we, you know, the Coliseum at University of Nebraska, right next to, you know, Coliseum that's still there after all these years. It's strong, it, it's supportive, and so we came up with this concept. Prior to this transformation, probation functions were juvenile intake, which was the first pillar, pre-adjudication investigation, and then supervision. It wasn't quite case management, it was supervision, following the court's orders. So we have case management, which is a new concept, and we have re-entry. Because as I told you, LB 464 not only solidified the pilot program, but it also added some new things that said, no longer do we want juvenile parole in our system. We want aftercare. We want re-entry. So when those juveniles still go to that highest level of care, they come out on probation now. The court has more authority now than they did prior. The court now maintains jurisdiction of those individuals once they go to that facility and they come out. So the court has control to say, this is what that juvenile needs during that re-entry hearing. And so we had to build a whole new piece of our system. And we had to add to our case management to say, you're no longer just a probation officer. You're a case manager. You not only need to worry about the court orders that are set forth, but you also have to worry about the services, you have to worry about the family, you have to worry about school. So we added more components to what the probation officer needed to do so it was more holistic. And we did a lot more pre-adjudication supervision that we've never done before in most jurisdictions. Most jurisdictions outside of our metro area didn't do pre-adjudication supervision. This is when a kid comes in front of the court right away after a law violation and there's issues and there's concerns. Well, we shouldn't just ignore that and say, well, you've got to wait till we adjudicate you, until we put you on probation, which could be anywhere from three to five months down the road. We're able to address those issues now, and the court can say, we need somebody to look after you because things just aren't right. Or I need an expedited evaluation because Johnny's coming in and he's, parents are saying he's using drugs left and right. So we have those now expedited type services we can put in place earlier on. Our hope and our goal with those expedited services are it's going to be a shorter term of probation because we're addressing the issues up front instead of waiting to the back end to address them, and we're going to have a higher successful completion rate of probation. That's our goal, and our goal is that they do not come back to the system. So this was the concept that was created, and Jeannie's going to go in depth a little bit more about each one of these pieces of these pillars, we call them, um, so that we get in concept. So, over this short amount of time, this juvenile justice transition has taken place. And so we've really worked with a lot of key stakeholders and partners in order to get this ramped up within the nine months that the legislature had provided us in the past year. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie, and she's going to talk a little bit about each one of these pieces of the, of the pillar. Thank you, Corey. All right, so as Corey mentioned, um, the intake function has always been a function of probation. However, um, with some of the recent changes and research and initiatives that have happened, um, one of the things that we're also looking at in terms of intake is what are some alternatives to those youth who might not necessarily need secure detention. Um, so probation currently does serve as the gatekeeper for the intake function. So a youth can be taken into temporary custody by law enforcement and then probation would utilize a standardized risk assessment instrument to screen that youth to, dis to determine if they would need secure detention, staff secure detention, maybe released with some conditions or straight release um, without any conditions. One of the things that we talk about with the intake assessment is it only really looks at two factors and that is the youth's risk to reoffend prior to the next court hearing or to flee the court's jurisdiction. And so when we talk about alternatives, our biggest goal for alternatives to detention um, is to have alternatives regardless of our geographic area. So we do not necessarily at all want justice by geography. So depending on where you live, something might be available, but if you live somewhere else, it's not. 
So we really want to look at each of those youth individually. What do they need? Do they have to be in secure detention? And so again, this is building services, building capacity. And um, detention alternatives don't necessarily have to be a service that would be monetary that you would have to pay for. It can be something very creative. It can be, um, and especially a lot of times in the rural areas where there's not as many um, services available, people do get very creative and say, what other options do we have? Can the youth go to grandma's for the night until things calm down at home? Um, so we don't necessarily have to talk about an exchange of money, but we just have to have um, places that youth can go or services that the family can utilize in order to, um, for the crisis to de-escalate. Um, and, and again, a lot of this comes from that research, as Corey mentioned earlier, he talked about some of the brain development um, and, and looking at the outcomes of those youth that go to detention. Simply having a youth sit in detention can make outcomes worse for them if that wasn't necessarily what they needed to begin with. Oh, sorry. Actually, if you want to flip to or maybe even three. There you go. All right, um, Corey talked about this a little bit already, um, but just to kind of reiterate, um, in 561 there was authority for pre-adjudication services to be utilized, and there still is that authority. What, what was changed in 464 is just who was paying for, for those. Um, but prior to adjudication, at that initial court hearing, if services are needed, they absolutely can be ordered um, to have immediate access um, and supervision with that family consenting to voluntary services at this point. So this is prior to youth being adjudicated delinquent. So the court would order the conditions, the family um, and the parties would consent to those conditions. Uh, probation can also be assigned to supervise the youth, okay? So Corey kind of had talked about that early on. If there's some really significant things going on and they say we need some extra help keeping things on track or help informing the court what's going on, um, that's definitely where we would get into that. The legislative um, bills then define, as I mentioned, who's the payment responsibility for such services um, if the family cannot afford to pay for that. And one of the things that we talk about too is although we have been appropriated dollars to look at for service provision, we also um, utilize those dollars in a very fiscal responsible manner and utilize those as a last resort. So we do look at all other funding sources, whether that be um, private insurance, whether that maybe be some grant in the community that a, a service is operational under, whether that be the parents um, have a financial ability to pay for something outright. So we look at all of those other services as well. So that pre-adjudication services and supervision um, can continue um, through the adjudication phase. Um, assessments. Uh, I, I think we talk a lot about really wanting to understand the individual youth and family that we're looking at. So being able to assess the risk and needs, um, looking at interviewing that juvenile and their family to say, okay, what is really going on? And identifying those um, supportive interventions that would be helpful to the youth and family. We also at that point um, talked about, or as Corey mentioned earlier, um, probation really serves kind of that social work case management. It's really a blended, balanced aspect. And so we can also assist families with accessing services that might be available in the community without um, any involvement of the court. And so if, if we get to a point to say, wow, um, there might be some services you would be able to access, or you let's look at um, access Nebraska and see if, if your family is Medicaid eligible. So again, getting that up front so services can be implemented sooner rather than later. Um, the behavioral health needs, there's all types of screens and assessments that can be completed during that process and the court can um, absolutely order further assessment and then also integrate the recommendations of those assessments into um, ongoing work that's, that's done through probation. Uh, behavioral health evaluations, identifying the clinical treatment needs, so whether or not there's a diagnosis, um, whether or not that youth needs some type of medication um, to help meet their needs, and identify other resources that the youth and or family needs. 
And I hopefully you'll recognize one of the things that we talk about too. Probation isn't just a juvenile. It really is um, a community effort. So it is working with the families. It is working with the school. It is working with the churches. It is working with all of those people that touch the life of that youth. So we really don't focus solely on that youth. Um, and then the assessments and um, behavioral health evaluations can, can guide the treatment plan um, working through that probation term and the therapeutic and community support that would go along with that. Uh, Corey mentioned earlier a little bit too about the assessment process and um, LB 561 laid out some provisions for expediting evaluations. Um, 464 also came in and clarified that a little bit and said we still need to expedite evaluations but we need to expedite them more so for those kids that are in detention. So um, evaluations ordered there are a 21 day time frame that the youth would need to reappear um, in the court and youth that are out in the community those evaluations are a 30 day turnaround time. So again pretty quick evaluation um, and report completion and being able to get back in front of the judge to say what can we do sooner rather than later. Um, that, that those are completed during the predispositional process. Um, providers then would, you know, obviously we had a lot of work to do with providers to say, okay, these are the standards, this is, this is what's driven by statute, this is what we have to follow. Um, and while 21 days may seem like a long time, by the time you think about that and you talk about getting a referral out, getting something scheduled, meeting with the youth and family, getting a report written up, having that come back to be reviewed um, before submitted to court, really that goes by rather quickly. Um, so that, that was a huge feat when we were talking about educating the providers about the needs, the turnaround time, what this would look like. Um, and so again, uh, you know, constantly looking at can we meet the needs for the capacity that, that's being referred, do we need to solicit for additional providers to take on that need um, and those options for the juveniles. Um, additionally, uh, Corey talked a lot about the case management function um, and supervision and caseloads are all juvenile specific. Um, so we really moved away from that. If you're a probation officer, you can maybe see some adults and some juveniles, but we want to specialize that and say, as Corey talked about, the evolution of juvenile justice, juveniles really are different. So let's make sure we specialize and treat them differently. Um, we have two different types of caseloads. Again, one that, that would even focus more on those higher risk youth. Again, special skilled, um, specially trained officers. And then um, some of the lower risk youth. And, and lower risk probably isn't the correct term because they're not technically low risk. They would still be a moderate risk, but some lower than the higher risk population um, would then be on a, on a, a separate caseload. So again, really specializing and, and finding out exactly what's needed. Um, enhanced services available at all stages um, and then the judicial oversight. Um, so the court is really uh, notified um, and, and driving changes to service and things that are happening throughout the process of that supervision. Um, some of the core elements of the case management process that you've probably heard weaved in throughout a lot of this um, because we, we believe wholeheartedly in um, that collaborative process. So we talk a lot about um, parental engagement, um, family involvement, and, and family is defined by that youth. Um, so family can look different to every person. Uh, team meetings, um, very collaborative again. Could, could be service providers, could be school officials, um, could be extended family. Um, provider engagement, if a youth is receiving services, what that may look like. Um, whether or not there are ancillary services that that youth is involved in. So what does their um, drug testing look like? Um, school engagement. Is there a victim in the case? Um, the officer would also engage in some of that victim contact. Um, records checks to ensure that the youth is continuing to stay out of trouble. Um, Long-term case planning for while that youth is on probation and helping the family to transition and, and, and set up for when probation is no longer involved. Building positive support systems, again I think that's that real collaborative and community approach. 
um, relapse planning and a lot of that would be in collaboration with the service providers engaged. Um, we also have um, some control features that are able to be utilized through the court such as electronic monitoring and tracking and those types of things so that could be a core um, element of the, of the case, case management. Uh, the treatment services and ancillary services I've already talked about a little bit. Um, the last pillar that um, was mentioned was the reentry process. And again, this is new. Um, this is new to probation. So, uh, and I, I think Corey talked about this a little bit as well. Um, when the youth is committed um, to the Office of Juvenile Services, to YRTC, Kearney, or Geneva, they are done so on an order of intense supervised probation. And so while at the facility, the officer, the probation officer that will supervise that youth begins to work with the youth and family while they are in the facility. So we look at um, what does that family transition planning look like. Um, there is a family team meeting held once per month to bring all partners together to talk about this. Um, there is a formal transition plan, an individual re-entry plan submitted to the court prior to that transition happening for again that court approval to say yep, this looks good, this is on track, or oh, there's something missing that we need to look at. Um, again, upon discharge, we will assess the risk and needs of the youth. Um, an ongoing um, assessment um, to what that risk may look like to the community. So obviously, um, probation is definitely in the community, in the field, advocating for the community um, right arm of the court. And then um, once released, they are intensely supervised. So they are put in at the highest level of probation supervision for some time until we can ensure that they are, that risk has gone down and they can be stepped down to a lower level of supervision. Um, and, and so again, um, as Corey talked about with the brain development, um, there are still lots of, um, you know, relapses. Um, that can occur with youth even after they are sent to the facility. So there is a process of being able to utilize graduated sanctions that could also um, prior to violating youth, so really working with, with them, meeting them where they're at in, in what types of issues they have going on. Um, that that reentry process um, talks about infect, effectively engaging the community and family um, and, and really looking at the specialization, again, um, we have um, at each of the facilities or in each of those districts where the facilities are located, um, reentry supervisors, again, to assist both the youth and the courts as, as youth are transitioning out um, and, and looking at the higher risk um, probation officers to have a lower caseload to really um, strategically manage the higher risk youth and enhance that family engagement and um, look at the court approved transition process. So before I get into the legislative bill a little more deeper, why did we do all this? What was the, what was the reason of why we instituted all this type of programming, services, strategies around high risk, low risk, risk instruments? You heard that several different times, both on the intake, when a kid gets a new law violation, why do we determine whether or not they should go to jail or go, go home? Why do we determine what type of treatment needs? Why do we determine what level of supervision somebody needs? One size doesn't fit all. Juveniles are different, right? So we went to the science. Evidence-based practices really drove us to these to these types of services and this type of system. Because we know putting a kid in secure detention because we're mad at him doesn't work. That kid comes out worse than when they went in. We know by supervising a low risk juvenile that has very little issues, maybe they have one law violation or got kicked out of school, at a high intense level actually increases their likelihood to recidivate. And is that what we're about? No, so we went to the science, we went to the research, and it said to us, here is the appropriate and correct way to supervise these juveniles. Don't over-supervise. Low-risk juveniles, kids are going to make mistakes. Like I said, 24 years old, you're still making bad decisions and choices. I'm going to be 40. I make bad decisions and choices, all right? 
especially males, we make a lot of bad decisions and choices. But we, in our system, know we need to treat that differently. Kids are kids. They're going to make bad decisions. Sometimes what we did on probation is we over-supervised, and we expected that kid, because they were under court jurisdiction and because we were probation officers, to be perfect. And when they didn't, when they weren't perfect, what did we do? Boom, yanked them out of the home, took them back to court and said, judge, do something with them because they got expelled from school. Well, of course they got expelled from school. Here are the reasons and the issues. So we have assessments now that help drive us to the adequate services that those individuals need. We have evaluations by clinical people that tell us this kid has a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue. Here's the level of engagement that's needed for that individual. We shouldn't expect a kid that uses and has been using for two years to stop using right away today. It's the same as if everybody said, no more donuts, no more donuts for today. You're going to have people that are going to go and get donuts, especially when they're laying out on the back counter just like this, because trust me, drugs in the high school are lay almost laying out on the counter. I mean, it is just like that. This is a science. And so we're really looking at that research to drive us on how do we adequately supervise and case manage these juveniles. W one thing that we, we have a lot of stumbling things. We have things that we're still working on. Our system is not even close to being perfect. We know right now a status offender, a kid that runs away, a kid that go doesn't go to school and is a truancy, actually stays in our system longer. We have higher expectations for them that they you haven't gone to school in five years. Your parents never made it a, a, you know, for you to go to school. And now all of a sudden the court has jurisdiction and we expect every day you're in school. And when you don't, you get in trouble. Something may happen. We've got to correct all those past, past years of behaviors and issues with that family as we move forward. So our system is continually learning, growing, evolving, and becoming better at what we do. So, so you've heard Jeannie talk about that, that the, the evidence-based practices, those research modules that tell us, here's how you need to do these things. And that's what we're instituting within our, within our system. The high-risk kids, they're going to get more services, more supervision. Those low-risk kids aren't going to get seen as much, aren't going to have as many supervision um, appointments, and we're going to rely on community-based systems to help with that structure and that support. One of the big pieces that we've done over the last couple of years is really link with the schools. If, if our probation officers are not in the high schools, they're not doing their job. School is one of the most critical hooks to keeping kids on track, not using drugs and alcohol, and not recidivating, causing crime. So our, our probation officers are really engaged in the schools and should be engaged in those schools with those schools. So as we move on now, talk a little bit about a little bit more about um, LB 464 this past year. Um, this was a monumental shift in the way we did business across the courts. So not only was our probation staff having to learn new ways of doing business, not only were Judge Warden just walked into Judge Warden and the other judges having to learn new ways to effectively impose disposition, predisposition reports, evaluations. We now have all the attorneys across the state of Nebraska that we have to do some training and education on. We have providers across the state. So as you can see, this was not just a one person, one system change. This was a multitude of changes across multiple systems across the state of Nebraska. We're still learning and growing, and part of this bill didn't fix everything. We still have issues that we need to come back to the legislature and get fixed. One of it is funding. What LB 464 did was put more funding back on the counties and put more funding back on the states. So there was this who pays more, who pays for what, and there's some unclear lines in the legislation of when the county should pay for services for juveniles and when the state should pay for services. So those are some things that we're going to go back and continue to clean up and address with the legislature. The other thing is I've had a conversation with judges um, the last couple of years, and just because the transition took place didn't mean services were going to be there automatically overnight. We need to grow services, we need to enhance services, and we need more services. We sorely lack the infrastructure support for foster care across the state of Nebraska. It's, 
in the western part of the state, it's really, really bad. But it's even bad in Omaha. We have inadequate foster care for not only the abuse neglect population, but also for our law violation cases. And so that's, an, that's something that we're continually working towards. Um, how do we increase recruitment? So if you know somebody that wants to be a foster family, see Darren Duncan, he'll get them signed up today. Um, we need infrastructure of the um, foster care system across the state. Um, the, other, the other piece that we know we have to address is mental health with juveniles. Mental health with juveniles is becoming more and more of an issue. And unfortunately, it's becoming more and more of a court issue as we move forward with these juveniles. And so we have mentally ill kids coming into the court system and the families are trying, the system's trying, but unfortunately they come into the court system. And so how do we address those mental health with the reform that took place years, years ago that took away our mental health facilities, but yet didn't put the infrastructure within the communities. So we need to continue to build mental health support systems within our communities across the state of Nebraska as well. Um, I'm kind of going off script, so I'm losing track of my spot here. Let's see. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Actually, go two more slides. We're going to go down. So as we continue to move forward with this, with this reform, we need a lot of partners. One more. We need a lot of partners that come in. You heard early on that we've been engaged in a lot from the president in, in the opening remarks. We have three big reform efforts that are going on across our state. Our Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. This initiative is not a get out of jail free card for juveniles. It is not hug a thug. It is not, um, you know, we're pissed off at this kid because they're not doing what they're supposed to and we're going to put them in jail. This is really a reform effort to come up with strategies, appropriate strategies on how to deal with juveniles. The correct answer isn't lock every kid up. The correct answer isn't let every kid go. It's somewhere in between there. And so these are, these are strategies where individuals come to the table and really look towards what inventive ways can we come up with services. Maybe it's an ankle monitor that will keep this kid at home just while they come into the court system. Maybe it's linking them with a partner at school where they check in at school every day and they check in when they leave if school's an issue. So coming up with some inventive ways to working with these kids differently because they are a different population that we deal with. So juvenile detention alternatives has really done a lot for us in the communities that we have it. We currently have it in Sarpy County and in Douglas County, Nebraska. And we have a statewide coalition that's looking on expansion of that in other jurisdictions. But I can tell you what we've done in the metro area is we've been able to reduce Douglas County Youth Center before Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative started from 180 kids that were locked up in a secure detention facility to now their population last week was down below 80. So in three years, 100 more kids are getting more services in the community than being locked up in a secure detention area. We still have big issues. We have big issues with the runaway population and what do you do with a kid that continually runs? What do you do? Locking them up don't work because as soon as they get out, they run. Putting them back at home don't work because then they just run away from home. So we don't have all the answers yet. We're continuing to research and find out inventive ways to deal with this population because they are very unique. One of the things Jeannie didn't touch on during the case management, she talked about how we separate based on strategies, based on high risk, low risk. What we're also doing is separating based on, on issues. So status offenders, those kids that are skipping school, running away. If you ask a probation officer, those are harder than the kid that went up and has severe law violations and substance abuse issues. The status offenders are harder to work with that haven't committed a law violation they're only in the court because society has said you have to go to school. You cannot run away from home. But they are the hardest kids to work with because they have deep rooted issues. And so we still haven't figured out how do we address those issues. But we're also specializing our case management structure so that we have officers that are getting very skilled and knowledgeable on that specific topic area, whether it's substance abuse, mental health, status offenders. Okay? So those are the types of things that we're also doing with ours so we can really get our officers skilled to work with this population. Um, 
The other initiative that, we're, that we talk about is a crossover youth practice model, and we've expanded this in two times, and we're going to continue to expand it next year, and I'm hoping to bring that out to Western Nebraska next year. Crossover youth practice model is we still have issues in our system where a kid starts out on the abuse and neglect side, where they're in the court system because not of what they've done, but because of what somebody has done to them. And eventually those kids cross over. Because of this, the deep-rooted issues we talked about, they're now coming over to the delinquency or status side. And so the court now has open dockets, so to speak. They have an open case on an abuse and neglect, and they have now an open delinquency case because this kid may have punched a teacher. The kid may have stole something from somewhere. The kid may have drug and alcohol issues. These are those kids that we have to work differently with. Do they really need to be on the delinquency side because of an issue or can we address that issue on the open 3A side or vice versa. It's looking at those cases differently because these are different kids. What really got me entrenched in this initiative about four years ago when I brought it to the state of Nebraska, I went to a national summit and they were showing the data. And they showed the data that this kid had been physically and sexually abused from the age of two to the age of 12 had been in behavioral disorder classes, had an IEP, all the things you can think of. And he punched a teacher in the face and he was in front of the court and in, in secure detention because he punched a teacher in the face because of his disorders that he's had. That's wrong. That is simply wrong. We should not be treating those kids the same as we have a delinquent kid. So the crossover youth practice model looks at things differently like I talked about with the JDAI. How do we address their issues which are very deep rooted and are family issues? their family issues and how to address those. So the crossover youth practice model currently is in five jurisdictions in the state of Nebraska and we're looking to expand that year after year. Once again, it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's not in Scotts Bluff, you have to do it this way. It is looking at the needs of that jurisdiction and how they can address this issue. And they define, they define what the term crossover means to them. They define how they're going to address that issue and they determine how their courts and, and they're going to handle those, those issues as well. One of the other things that I want to talk about a little bit is I think that what we've done in Nebraska is we're on the cutting edge. We're on the cutting edge of what we're doing on the juvenile justice side. And how I know that is all of a sudden, everybody's heard in the paper the prison issue, right? The Nico Jenkins issue, and there's been now a group form, Justice Reinvestment with the Council for State Governments. Um, one, of the, one of the judges out here, uh, District Court Judges, Judge Dobovone, on that commission. Um, another judge, myself, Ellen Burkowski, Chief Justice, chairs that with the governor and, um, and a senator. And we're sitting around a table, and this is on adult community corrections. And after the second meeting, I went up to Chief Justice and I said, I have to laugh, Chief. I said, I've been on the juvenile justice side my whole career up until now. Everything we're talking about in that justice reinvestment is everything that we just instituted in the past two to three years on the juvenile justice side. Why is it all of a sudden different in rocket science? And we've got to figure this out when the juvenile justice has been doing it for years, talking about individual caseloads, talking about more treatment dollars, talking about enhancing services in the community, all of those things, instituting more standardized risk screening assessments. So juvenile justice can actually, for a change, maybe teach some adult justice system folks some things that we've been doing on our side. So in closing, there's also um, a chart that we've put in place for stakeholders across, across the state in what we've done across probation in the past couple of years. So the last, last couple of things that I want to say is this took place because of partnership, collaboration on multiple fronts. This wasn't a judicial branch, this wasn't an executive branch, this wasn't a legislative branch. It took all three branches of government to come together in order to make this juvenile justice transformation work. Like I said, we still have wrinkles, we still have issues, we still have places where we need to improve upon. But the progress that we've made in the short time that we've been doing this shows hope that we can make changes of the juveniles and the families we work with because that's why we're all here. We're all here because there's an individual that remember in our past that if I would have done this, I could have made that change. If I would have done this differently, smarter, 
better, made a better decision at this point in time, we could have had a different outcome. And so each and every day, that's what we do is we continue to say, how can we do things differently to enhance and build upon the system we have to make the system better? Because anymore, status quo isn't good enough. In the administrative office, we kind of got a saying, if we're standing still, things are passing us by. So we have to keep up with the way that things are transforming. So the national partnerships are key. That's why we like the national partnerships with Georgetown University, with the National uh, Center for State Courts, uh, with Juvenile Detention Alternative and any Casey Foundation. Those partnerships keep us wanting to move forward and enhance our system for the better. So I appreciate you inviting Jeannie and myself out here to talk about this juvenile transformation to talk about where we're going to the future and let you know we're not done yet. We're continuing to build and grow in what we do. And so I think we got some time, a few, few minutes for questions. So we want to leave some, some time for questions. If I can't answer it, I have four judges right here that I will surely deflect the question to um, and they can answer that. But if there's any questions, No questions? Our, oh, we got, there's a, that, see, it just takes a minute sometimes. In the back there, go. The question is, what are the services, what are the different services here within this state than in other states? Okay. Um, we may not have different, we may not have unique, but one of the things we want to do is build more. It's not about what, what's different. There are some states that have different multitudes of services. We, ha we lack some services in the state of Nebraska, intensive outpatient treatment. We really lack intensive outpatient treatment because juveniles once a week go into substance abuse treatment sometimes isn't enough. We need to bump that up. Well, when we don't have it, they have to go to inpatient. So there we're bypassing a level of care, putting a kid in a higher level of care because we don't have something. Um, we don't have a lot of in-home services. One of the things we're working on a collaborative effort with, um, with a grantee to enhance multi-systemic therapy, functional family therapy, and in-home services. The more services we can put in the home to change the structure of the family dynamics, the better chance we're going to have with that kid and any other kid in that home. And so we're really looking at enhancing those services and bringing those services to the state of Nebraska. So we're looking and we're checking to see what's working, what's the evidence show that's working, and what can we do to bring those into our state. So those are just to name a couple. We lack residential, but my hope is we get more in-home services. We won't need as much residential or out-of-home care. We can address those issues in the family home. Um, one of the things I always say when people say, well, isn't it good to put a kid in a group home? Well, yeah, we're addressing that kid's behaviors, right? So we're taking a kid that's in a dysfunctional family, he's come into the court, we say, Johnny, you're no longer going to be at home because you're just disruptive, you're not going to school, you're not doing what you're supposed to, so we put him in a group home, whether it's in, in the town or out of town, wherever. We put Johnny out. Now they're in a structured 24-7 facility, they're going to school, they're doing everything that's asked because it's very structured and routine. They go to that facility for three to six months, typically about three to four months. Johnny's doing great, right? He's in structure, he's going to school, not using drugs and alcohol, not around his peer group anymore. Johnny's doing great. Let's transition Johnny back home. Johnny goes back home. I'll, I'll say on the good side, a month, we've done well. Johnny hasn't had issues. Month goes by, we're starting to see those same issues that were prior to going to the group home that we're seeing now. Why? And we wonder why, right? Johnny's not doing what he's supposed to. Is it really a Johnny issue? We didn't change the environment of where Johnny was from. And until we change that environment, there's, there's going to have that issue. I mean, we see it day in and day out. There are some of those kids that, we do, that do come back and do well. Don't get me wrong, it's not every single kid. But what we see routinely is we don't change the environment. Until we change that environment of those in-home services, we're going to keep having Johnny's come back home and have issues a month, two months later. There's another question. I have a friend who was um, foster parent and she adopted this child has a mental health disorder and he went from 18 to 19 in the system out of system. Well, lately he had a monitor on his ankle and he was in the court system and the mother had to come up with the money for the ankle monitor. Is that because 
Correct. He, 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 tra he did that transition from juvenile court to the adult court system, and adult court system is, is still different. It's still different. If, if in juvenile we don't charge for the use of ankle monitoring, that's a service we provide through the probation office. But once it goes into the adult court system, there's different rules, and there's different funding, and they don't fund all the services that we do on the juvenile side. There's been discussion about we call those gap kids. We call those kids that aren't aren't really out of the home, but yet are treated through the system out of like they're adults, but they're really not. And so there's been a lot of talk about what do we do with those gap kids? How do we treat those kids differently? That we say 16 to 21 is that gap age. So what do we do with those kids that's different? How does the system function to assist instead of harm? Because sometimes once those younger kids go into the adult court system, it's a different ball game. It's not the same as it is the juvenile court system. And, and Judge Warden and, and Judge Mickey, they, they can, and Judge uh, they, Harford, they can all tell you, I have to have a different hat on when I'm a county court judge versus a juvenile court judge, because they play both those roles. So it, it's a little bit different. Now, there was part of LB 464 that's, that is coming into effect in the next few years. It's, it's a rolling effect where no longer will those kids who are under the age of 18 that commit an adult law violation, excluding the top felony offenses, murder and those types of things, they'll start in juvenile court. So that'll come to the juvenile court judge first instead of the county attorney saying you're going to the adult court system. So there's some hope that we can address the issues differently instead of going to the adult court system where it's pay a fine or, or go to jail or get probation, those types of things, because we can address issues differently in the juvenile system. Great question. Anything else? I'm here for a little bit longer. If there's anything, feel free. Thank you very much.